The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today we're going to talk about Hund's cases. Uh, this is a topic which uh, cause, uh, causes most people to either have a migraine or go immediately to sleep. Uh, but I have a unique way of talking about them. And so uh, rather than spend all of our time drawing diagrams of vectors precessing, which we will do a little of, uh, I'll talk about the four different ways in which we're going to understand or, or think about Hund's cases. First of all, Uh, the energy levels are expressed, are described by pattern forming quantum numbers. And we'd like to know what those are uh, because we know that we understand the energy levels for a single sigma state. Uh, they're very simple and it's a pattern that we can recognize. And so if there's a magic decoder that enables us to take the real energy levels and split them up into things that look like singlet sigma states will be ahead of the game because we'll be able to see uh, the crucial patterns that enable us to make assignments and recognize important things. And so the pattern forming quantum numbers uh, are rotational quantum numbers and they're either Ha uh, they're either J or N. And uh, J is a rigorously good quantum number, and J can be half integer when you have a half integer spin. N is the angular, total angular momentum exclusive of spin. It's always integer. And so anyway, these are the two uh, pattern forming quantum numbers that appear and we always have the energy levels as a rotational constant times uh, a pattern forming quantum number. What do I use in my notes? Well, I'll just write this way. And so that's what we're lo looking for. And we get J in case A and in case C. We get uh, uh, N in case B and uh, uh, maybe case D, although that's a little bit confusing. Okay, so we'd like to somehow be able to pick out repeated singlet sigma-like patterns. And for example, if we had a triplet delta state, we, have, we would have six times singlet sigma. There'd be six patterns that would look like a singlet sigma state. Actually, three would look like a singlet sigma plus and three would look like a singlet sigma minus. And so this, this multiplying of patterns is a sort of a generalization on this and uh, Hund's case A uh, helps us to uh, see that. Okay, so this is one of the, th the main topics that I'll talk about. The other is we'll have a, an effective Hamiltonian and we'll use perturbation theory. And we're always looking at some sort of an off diagonal matrix element versus some sort of a, a difference in energy between two zero order levels. And so it's the off diagonal matrix element that that's destroys the Hund's case and the difference in zero order levels that tries to preserve it. And often when we convert using angular momentum transformations from one basis set to another, the roles of preserving and destroying get reversed. That's, uh, there's a lot of uh, examples of that in my book. I'm not going to talk about that, but you should keep in mind that one physical effect can help you to stay in a limiting case, and another physical effect opposes that, 
And of course, if you go to the other limited case, the roles of those two phenomena will, those two parameters will be reversed. And maybe we'll see some of that. Then there's the vector precession models. And usually, when you see vector precession uh, presented, all the work goes into drawing these pretty pictures, and nobody ever tells you what you use them for. And what you use them for is understanding how some property in the body frame makes itself felt in the laboratory frame. So you have, you have the molecule rotating, and if you rotate a vector uh, randomly, you, you lose its vector character. But if you rotate it in some special way, certain of its components might get averaged away and others might not. And one of the best things to use to understand the power of vector precession is the Zeeman effect. The Zeeman effect, uh, um, so basically what you have is a field in the laboratory. And you have angular momentum in the body frame. And there's one, uh, for, uh, there's one total angular momentum. And you want to ask, well, how does, say, L or S uh, uh, make itself felt in the laboratory? Well, we know that L gets destroyed, uh, but lambda is preserved. So lambda is uh, along the, the, the body fix Z axis and that might project onto J. And so J, uh, well, we'll see that. So we will, we will make arguments about how do L and S contribute to the Zeeman effect using vector precession models. And this will illustrate what they're good for. And often, you know, you'll be able to bring out one of these models to explain why a certain effect is observable in the laboratory. And that's what it's for. And it's always a question of how does a thing, a vector-like thing, get partially averaged? And what part isn't averaged? And the last, which we won't do at all, is angular momentum transformations using 3J, 6J, et cetera. Uh, it would be a good thing to do these sorts of transformations, but I'm not going to do it because I don't, I don't like them. I mean, they're useful, but you see, I, I never do any work. You guys do the work for me, so I don't use the angular momentum transformation. But you can't do anything at all without them. OK, so let's, let's uh, start out by taking an, as an example Instead of something evil, like sextet delta, the minimal problem the, the, with which I can illustrate everything. So suppose we have a doublet pi state and a doublet sigma plus state. That's the minimum you need to do almost everything. Uh, and I mean, you need to have spin not equal to zero. And you need to have uh, the angular momentum of the orbital angular momentum not equal to zero. So L equals one, S equals a half, that's what you get. Uh, and so we'll talk about these two states in various uh, uh, pictures. So the first thing to do is I assume, since you all are doing sextet delta, that you can work out the, the effect of Hamiltonian for these two states in case A. And so here it is. Okay, and normally we think of doublet sigma as a separate electronic state from doublet pi. But when spin orbit is really big, or when uh, the non-sphericity that gives rise to the splitting between pi and sigma is small compared to spin orbit or rotation, 
Well, then these really become what's called a p-complex. And uh, uh, so then, instead of being three separate substates, uh, uh, two states, two substates and another state, they become components of one state. And by just adjusting the relative magnitudes of the splitting between pi and sigma and the spin orbit constant and b, uh, we can, this one example can take us to all of those limits. Okay, so we have e pi, e pi, e sigma. I also should mention that this is one matrix for both, uh, we're going to have, uh, whenever we have two signs, one above and the other, the upper sign will be for the E symmetry. Okay, and so we start out with the, the most important thing, the electronic energy. And then we have A, do I call it A pi, yeah, A pi over two, minus A pi over two. Since this is a separate state and it's a sigma state, lambda is zero and the spin orbit splitting or the spin orbit energy is zero and so there's no A in here. Okay, then we have the, you know, what we get from the rotational uh, Hamiltonian, we have B pi y squared minus two, B pi y squared. Okay, and the fact that they're not y, the same thing here and here just came from the fact that the rotational Hamiltonian was uh, j squared minus jz squared plus s squared minus sz squared, and this is L perpendicular, which we often forget, but we won't always forget it here. Okay, and uh, uh, then we have plus b sigma. Uh, and this funny thing happens when you make the, remember for sigma states, um, when, um, for pi states, when you apply the parity operator, you get another uh, component. Uh, you take all of the projection quantum numbers and you change their signs. Uh, and so in order to find eigenstates of the parity operator, you take sum and difference linear combinations. When you do this to sigma states, when you change the, uh, uh, all of the projection, the signs of all the projection quantum numbers, uh, you get uh, something that uh, is not the original state, um, and uh, so you, you have the two sigma, the two components of a doublet sigma state transforming into each other, and that's disturbing. And so, but if we make parity functions, we discover that uh, uh, the, uh, the energy levels have this form, and you have this uh, minus or plus, and y is, uh, So anyway, so instead of having a six by six Hamiltonian, we have two three by threes, uh, and uh, uh, this is the only surprise, and it came from making the parity functions. Okay, so now I have to include, so I haven't put in the off-diagonal elements here, and there are going to be off-diagonal elements, and those off-diagonal elements will destroy Hund's case A when they get big enough. Uh, um, and so here we have minus b pi y squared minus one square root. And here we have minus beta y squared minus one square root. So this beta is meant to resemble the b and it's, it, it comes from the L uncoupling part of the rotational Hamiltonian. And uh, uh, then uh, we have, well this is symmetric, and uh, 
this is generally how one uh, denotes a, symmet a symmetric Hamiltonian. Okay, and so there's one more element here, and that will be the coupling between doublet sigma and uh, and doublet pi one half. Uh, this was a uh, th this matrix element here is uh, between double pi three halves and doublet sigma omega changed. That's why there's a J dependence here. The one between doublet sigma and doublet pi one half omega doesn't change, and so there is no J dependence, and that's a spin orbit term. But it can change. You can go from sigma one, uh, omega one half to omega minus one half, and that's what happens with the parity functions. And so you do get a J dependent term, and that's beta uh, one minus or plus y. And then we. So this is this is the guy that enables us to understand all of the Huns cases simply by making adjustments of the relative sizes of the control parameters. So we have uh, E pi zero minus E sigma zero. We have A pi and we have B, uh, BY. So these are the three things that make a difference. So, do beta and alpha depend on those things? Yeah. So, so alpha is spin orbit. Alpha is spin orbit and beta is, is L on coupling. And uh, spin orbit and L on coupling both have an L plus matrix element in there. And um, so, uh, if we pretend we know what the L plus matrix element is, then these things are related to the A's and B's. Okay, but we'll, we'll talk about that. I mean, if you say we have a P complex, if we have uh, an L equals one state, and somehow it has escaped being, L has escaped being totally destroyed, then we are entitled to write some things about alpha and beta. And when is L destroyed? It's when the, uh, the non-sphericity is very strong. When is the non-sphericity not strong? Rydberg states when the orbital radius is large compared to the not-spherical thing, it can start to think that it is on a spherical thing. And so that's when we are able to write uh, the alpha and beta in terms of A and B. Okay, but, but so, so sorry, normally though, can't do that. Normally you can't do that, uh, and, but I can do whatever I choose to do in this particular example. Okay, so no, I, I can see how, how, how the time to learn this through Rydberg states is pedagogically valuable. I guess I'm, I'm just confused in the case when you're non Rydberg states, how do you figure out exactly what those metrics all are? You don't, you can't. Uh, the only ones that I think you can almost always figure out to pretty high accuracy is everything having to do with spin orbit. Because that's basically an atomic property and if you have some idea of what is the atomic orbital nature of a particular uh, state, then you can, you can estimate the spin orbit extremely well. Because it's really immune to uh, interference effects, and uh, it's a very simple thing, and it's but very useful. L on coupling is really hard to, to figure out that. Yes. Um, okay, we will now uh, uh, talk about what are the physical effects that lead to the different Huns coupling cases. And so, uh, I guess there's one more. There's E by 3 halves minus E by one half. Let's put zeros here. Okay, so uh, we have several physical effects. Um, we can think of one of them as a ligand field. And so suppose you have a p orbital over here and you have a point charge over here and that p orbital could be oriented 
like that or like this. And since this thing over here is a nucleus, it's positively charged generally. And so which of these two arrangements is likely to be more stable? You know they don't have the same energy. This is a, uh, an orbital which is extended in this direction. So we have negative charge getting close to positive charge, and that's good. And here we have negative charge trying to avoid the positive charge, or at least the not acting like it knows where it is. So this is generally the more stable arrangement. Now, if this happens to be a halide, then it's the other way around, because then it's negatively charged. So anyway, the non-sphericity is what gives rise to the difference between this is pi, this is sigma. And so we have a pi state and a sigma state. And so uh, we, uh, we attribute the difference in energy between them as due to uh, the open shell orbital being on one atom and being split by the the, other, the, the, the charge associated with the other atom. So they're in a spherical field, a cylindrical field. And so this is one of the important things. This is why we talk about pi states and sigma states as being separate states. But if there's something that makes the non-sphericity small, then they become two parts of one state. Okay, so there's the ligand field. Uh, there's spin orbit. And spin orbit does two things. One, it makes this energy separation large. And two, it makes this energy, uh, sorry, uh, it makes this energy separation large. Okay, so uh, because this energy separation is A minus 2B. So spin orbit uh, enters into this uh, by making uh, this pi state look like two separate states. And, uh, but there is a, uh, a spin orbit interaction between this and uh, I mean, between the doublet pi 1 half and the doublet sigma state. And so spin orbit could split the pi state, but it can also mix the doublet pi one half with the doublet sigma and cause trouble in that way. So we have spin orbit that can do some stuff. And uh, so we have these five Huns cases that are commonly dealt with. Let me draw that over here. <coughs> So case A, that's strong spin orbit, stronger non sphericity and weak rotation. Okay, so I didn't, what I didn't do is I didn't write the, uh, um, the coupling terms. I mean, the coupling terms, we have the uh, Bj plus minus S minus plus, Bl plus minus S minus plus, and we have A over 2 L dot S, well, uh, L dot S. Okay, so that would be an lambda uh, L Z S Z and uh, uh, a L plus S minus plus S minus uh, L. Yeah. So these are the coupling terms. Okay. So case A, uh, we have delta E pi sigma largest the stronger non-sphericity. That leads to an energy difference between pi and sigma. Then we get uh, the uh, spin orbit, and there are two spin orbit things in this. The spin orbit constant for the pi state and the spin orbit interaction between doublet sigma and double pi one half. And then there's the weakest thing, and that's 
the rotation, and uh, that's by or beta y. So this is just the rotation within the pi state, and this is the rotational coupling between the pi state and the sigma state. And uh, okay, so this being strongest, we separate pi state from sigma state, and uh, for the usual case, this, the sigma state, is going to be uh, more stable, but it could be the other way around too, because this could be a halide or it could be just something with big orbitals and it exposes the, 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 uh, the nucleus to the other thing. So, so we, we talk about pi states and sigma states, and that's the usual situation. And it's also a happy situation because the Huns case A basis set is the most convenient to evaluate matrix elements in, and even when you have small deviations from Huns case A, you're, you're happy to work in that basis set. So in this basis set, we have good quantum numbers, not rigorously good quantum numbers, but de facto good quantum numbers. And we get basis functions, lambda s, sigma, omega, j, m. And the energy level patterns have the form B, JJ plus one, and we get one for each omega lambda state. So there's there's two uh, uh, there's double there's a B JJ plus one for double pi three halves, B JJ plus one for double pi one half, B JJ plus one for doublet sigma, and they're all double parity or du they're doublets. Uh, uh, but this is the magic decoder. If the states are separate, we get B, J, J plus one, repeated a bunch of times. And we, uh, we know what we're looking for in the spectrum. I'm surely not going to finish these notes because there's just an awful lot of stuff. But this is the important part right here. So and then in case B, we have weak spin orbit. I should also mention before we're going on, this is J dependent. And so we say this is weak. But the weak shall inherit the Earth as high enough J uh, uh, this will win. And it will always go from case A to case B because this will eventually win. But usually it happens at such high J that we never have to worry about that. Uh, so here we have the weak as opposed to the meek. But uh, okay, so the weak spin orbit. Now spin orbit dies right at the beginning. And uh, uh, We, we ha still have strong field or strong non-sphericity. So we still have a separation between pi states and sigma states. So it still makes sense to think about a, a pi state and a sigma state. Uh, but the spin orbit is weak and, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, so and we have intermediate. Rotation B, Y, or beta Y. So when this happens, uh, the energy separation pi sigma is much larger than everything as it was over here. But now uh, we have B, Y, beta Y next, and that's larger than. Uh, a and alpha. When this happens, lambda and s are still good. 
omega and sigma are bad, they get destroyed. Uh, sigma gets destroyed by spin uncoupling within the, the pi state. And since omega is lambda plus sigma, omega is destroyed. So you can't really say two quantum numbers are destroyed. Really, only one is destroyed. And you get, in exchange for the one that's destroyed, a new one, n, is created. And that almost always happens. You lose one quantum number, you get a new one. And you see this best when you're dealing with angular momentum recoupling. But that's something I don't want to talk about because I think it's too abstract and you really want to understand the physical stuff, which is what I, I'm good at, and everybody else can do angular momentum recoupling. So uh, when this happens, we can't use the Hund's case A basic, well, we can, it's just a kind of stupid thing. But one of the neat things that happens is that uh, you can't write the, wa the electronic wave function, or you can't separate the rotational wave function from the electronic wave function. So there's just one big set of quantum numbers. These are the, uh, the good or nearly good quantum numbers. And n becomes pattern forming, and the energy levels go as b n n plus 1. And n is going to be equal to j plus a half or minus a half in this particular case. So you'll get energy levels arranged as b n n plus 1, but there are going to be, for each value of n, there are going to be three states. You know, two, uh, uh, there's going to be six states, actually, uh, because you have uh, E and F symmetry. So, but this is the magic decoder. <clears throat> okay, case C is one that's mostly misunderstood, but case C is strong spin orbit. Spin orbit is stronger than everything. And this is possible, especially near the bottom of the periodic table. And we have moderate uh, field, moderate non-sphericity. So we have uh, A alpha much larger than E pi sigma or delta E pi sigma, and that's uh, uh, still large compared to B Y or uh, beta Y. So does it also have to be a relatively low J? Well, since this now has gotten really bumped up a lot, as J goes up, you start to overtake this and uh, uh, usually, you almost, uh, in case C, you almost never worry about transition back towards case B. Okay, so here we've lost a lot of quantum numbers because uh, um, the spin orbit is so strong that lambda is bad, sigma is bad, but omega is good. n is bad. So basically, the only quantum numbers you have left are j and omega. And that, that generally bothers people, because usually when you lose one, you get something back. Uh, and what is often missed by people in, uh, uh, who, who invoke Hund's case C is that spin orbit is big because there's an atom in there that has a big spin orbit constant. And there's going to be atom and molecule uh, structure. And so you will have uh, uh, things that I denote with a sub A, meaning atom. There'll be angular momentum, J, in strong spin orbit limit, J is a good quantum number for atoms. And the projection of J into the, onto the uh, molecular frame is going to be good. So these are different from 
omega and j, and these are hidden quantum numbers that are usually not known about because everybody read Hertzberg, and Hertzberg says the only good quantum numbers in Kc are omega and j. But these atom and molecule quantum numbers are often very important, and uh, they're extremely important for the rare earths where you have f orbitals that are uh, electrons in f orbitals, the f orbitals are really small, so the electrons in the f orbitals couple to each other to make LSJ states, and the, the, uh, uh, the size of the orbitals are, say, radius of three tenths of an angstrom or so, internuclear distance is two angstrom, so it doesn't really matter what the ligand is, the world is the structure of the atom split now in the weak ligand field, and so you get all sorts of atom-like quantum numbers in this special Hund's case C. So it's, it's interesting how people uh, decide to turn off their brains when they're encountering a Hund's case, and usually it's because you know, they, they think the important thing is the vector precession diagrams, you haven't seen them yet, case D. <laughs> this is usually Rydberg states. And case D corresponds to weak spin orbit, weak field. And why is that? Well, if you have an electron in a Rydberg orbital, it doesn't get near the nucleus, and that's where it gets its spin orbit from. And if it's far away from the two nuclei, well, then it doesn't really feel much of a field either because it's, it's so big. Uh, and, and so uh, case D is generally associated with Rydberg states, and so uh, you have By beta Y much, much larger than A and alpha, and they're usually on the same order of magnitude of delta E pi sigma. So you usually don't get J high enough in a non-Rydberg state in order to it's very rare, but it can happen. And so you would normally imagine going from like case, to case D when that happens? I'm sorry? You normally imagine going from case D to case D? When yes, that yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the first thing you lose is uh, you, you go to case B in a, a multiplet state, but then you have to overcome the non-sphericity, and that's harder to do. But when you've done it, then you're in case D. Uh, but with Rydberg states, both of these things are automatically really small when you have an ion core in closed shell. Because we're going to see in case E that you, you can have strong spin orbit again. OK, so, so when you are in case D, and especially for Rydberg states, you have one electron which has L and S and R, these uh, are good, and lambda, S, N, omega are bad. The basis functions are often N, L, S, R, M. We can do, we can say some more things about this, and I will do that. Uh, well, I do in the notes. Okay, finally we get to case E, and those of you who are good with combinatorics know that there should be a, a case F too, but that is never encountered, and it's really rare that you get case E as well. And case E corresponds to spin orbit large dy beta y next, and the non-sphericity smallest. So how do you not make the non-sphericity small? You have to get away from it. So you have to be in a Rydberg state. But if you're in a Rydberg state, you can't have spin orbit unless the ion core has spin orbit. And then you, have, you can have strong spin orbit, and you can, so you can get this with the ion core being open shell. And so it's again Rydberg land. These two are Rydberg and the others are everything else. Okay, so that's uh, 
Case E would be uh, a molecule where you have uh, an open cell ion core um, which has significant spin orbit and uh, so O2 would do the trick. Uh, acetylene, uh, there, and whenever you have uh, a ion core which is uh, a pi or delta state and uh, uh, a, a multiplet pi or delta state. So um, O2 uh, would look like uh, um, uh, well, it have, let me do this. Um, so uh, O2 neutral is a, a pi for uh, pi. So that's U G pi squared. And so this is a, a triplet sigma minus uh, ground state. But if you take away one of these electrons, now what you have is a uh, doublet pi uh, state, and th that so the Rydberg states of oxygen would be the simplest example that I can think of. Rydberg states of uh, yes. Okay. All right. So let me now. Can I ask one question, Brian? Right now, in the notes, you say for case D that. You know, B is, is much greater than either A or the, you know, delta E. Mm -hmm. And the reason why there's not six cases is because you say, you know, A is approximately equal to delta E. But is there some rigorous order? No. Uh, uh, I mean, well, you see, once you get into Rydberg states, uh, everything is really determined by what the electron is seeing. And there's core non-penetrating electrons which stay far away, and there's core penetrating electrons, and the core penetrating electrons, then you can have a difference in quantum defect between pi and sigma. And so uh, that can get, that, that separation can, this separation can get pretty big, uh, but for non-penetrating, uh, both uh, um, uh, um, this is, is really small. And so they move around, but the energy level structure is pretty much described by the same uh, formulas. Okay. Sorry, sorry. I don't want to. I don't want to be pedantic, but I actually never understood why there isn't a case F where, in one case, you know the A is larger than delta E, in the other case it's the other way around. Well, it's just because A is so big. Uh, that's, that, that's case E, right? Case, case F would look like case D, where, where B is large, right? And then spin orbit would be really, really small. Orbit. Okay, we'll talk about it some other time. I, I, can't, I can't even load it. I can't, <laughs> I can't even think about it. All right, so now uh, let's, let's look at the energy level structure uh, for a case A double pi state. A case A doublet pi state, so now what we're doing is we're going to apply perturbation theory. And you can always use perturbation theory when an off-diagonal matrix element is small compared to an energy difference. So uh, there are lots of cases like this, and the, the nicest one is let's look at the doublet pi state. And so if we look at the doublet pi state uh, and we do this uh, versus JJ plus one, the energy levels, so this is how um, E minus B JJ plus one would look. So if we do what's called a reduced term value plot, this is the energy as a function of J. We subtract out B JJ plus one just so that we can, this has the effect of enabling us to do a huge scale expansion because otherwise the energy levels would be going up like this and we couldn't look at anything. Now, and we always want to 
plot things with the same value of j because it's the j that's conserved. So off-diagonal elements would only be between states of the same j. So the, uh, the vertical axis is e minus jj plus 1, bjj plus 1, and we plot everything versus jj plus 1. And so this is what the doublet pi state would look like if it didn't have uh, any off-diagonal coupling between double pi one half and double pi three halves, it didn't have spin uncoupling. Okay, when you do perturbation theory, then you get two energy level, uh, two term curves. That this is at a over two, and this is at minus a over two, and they repel each other, and so you get straight lines. And the effective rotational constant for 3 halves is B pi plus uh, B squared over A minus 2B. And this is going to be B pi minus. So this is a small correction. These three, these two uh, rotational term curves look almost identical to an isolated doublet, uh, an isolated singlet pi state, uh, but their B values are just slightly different. And if you take the average, you get the B value of the pi state. And this comes from matrix element squared over energy denominator, and uh, this interacts with this, so that gets pushed up. This, interact, this interacts with that, that gets pushed down, and so we just get this term with either sign. So what this does is it says, okay, if we, we look at the energy levels in this picture, we're going to capture essentially the simple pattern. And there'll be a sigma state that will, will look sort of like that, somewhere above or below. Okay. And uh, uh, so in all of the limiting cases, you can make an energy level diagram where things have been simplified like this. But now, what time is it? Damn, okay, so I want to talk about vector coupling uh, before we get off of this topic. So for vector coupling, we have L, even though L is sort of fictitious because it's been destroyed, it precesses about the z-axis. And uh, that makes uh, lambda defined. And so what's left of this L after the non-spherical field has destroyed it, is we have a thing which would be LZ unit vector K. So this is a vector, it's pointing along the internuclear axis. <clears throat> and so here's the internuclear axis, and so you can, you can draw the usual vector precession picture and even though L doesn't exist, lambda does exist. And now, S doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't live in spatial coordinates. S is in spin coordinates. But the S vector knows about the axis because it's been marked by L. It's a little bit like a dog marking off its territory. Uh, if L weren't there, then S wouldn't know how to couple to the internuclear axis, and that's why all sigma states are in case B. So S knows about L through spin orbit, and it then also couples to the internuclear axis. So this is S. And this, so this is lambda, and this is sigma. So, uh, so we can think of uh, what's happening here as j vector is equal to r vector 
plus uh, LZ K. And you can either just put a S here or you can put uh, SZ K. So this is uh, this is this is always true. This reduction of s to a projection on on the axis is only true in case uh, a, and so I would prefer not to write it this way. I just write it this way. Okay. So now you have l and s that are defined, or parts of them are defined in the body frame. And we do something in the laboratory frame. Suppose we apply a big magnetic field. It's, it marks a particular space direction. And you'd like to know, how does L feel the magnetic field? L couples onto the body frame because it has no choice. The body frame couples precesses about J because J is uh, equal to this uh, plus all of that. So you can draw a vector and uh, you can, say, okay, this is J, this is R, this is the other stuff. And this, these things precess about J, they project on J, and J projects in the laboratory. And so you have two cosines. You have, I mean, if you want to know, uh, the uh, the projection of L, uh, or let's let's just say B, that, that's the magnetic field now, not rotational constant. L dot uh, uh, I guess um, B dot L. Uh, okay, so we wanted to know that. Well, well, we first want the cosine of uh, um, uh, of the, the angle that L makes with, with J. And so that's going to be lambda over JJ plus 1 square root. And then we want to know the cosine of the angle that J makes with uh, the, the Z direction. And that's um, I'm sorry, cosine of JL is that. And then we want cosine of J laboratory Z. That's going to be MJ over JJ plus 1 square root. So these geometric factors, these cosines, which are just ratios of lengths of vectors, then enable you to calculate how does lambda project into the body frame. You first project it onto J, then you project J onto the, the, the body Z, the laboratory Z axis, and that's it. For S, it's a similar sort of thing, except for S, S precesses about J. Um, or it processes about the body axis, but if you make the, uh, um, it projects, uh, uh, depending on the rotation, uh, the rotational quantum number either project, pre processes about J or processes about the, the body Z axis. And so you do the same sort of argument to say what is going to be the G factor associated with the spin. And, uh, and this is what you do. I mean, this is, this is how you actually make sense of what gets averaged out. What can you see if you are uh, asking for uh, some interaction in the z direction uh, in, the, in the body frame to split the energy levels? And um, um, we don't have much more time. So, Suppose we're in case B. In case B, uh, S, uh, we still have lambda defined, and S 
possesses about the body axis weekly uh, because, uh, uh, well, it's been marked. Um, unless lambda is zero, then, the, then it doesn't know about the body axis. So it doesn't take much to get S to decouple from the body axis to precess about J directly. Now J pre uh, couples directly into the laboratory because of M. And so in case B, uh, it's, it's, you get this weak coupling of S to the body axis. It takes very little rotation to bring it off of the body axis. And then the Zeeman effect sees S in the laboratory, even though it, uh, you had, you specified lambda. And so you can, you can, and you can even, by making the strength of the magnetic field large, you can cause S to decouple uh, from the body axis, and you can see a change of the Zeeman splitting from something which is weakly uh, dependent on the rotational quantum number to something that is just uh, given by the three possible, the possible values of M sub S. So you have M sub S, uh, uh, the, so the cosine of S in the laboratory would just be given by M sub S, uh, uh, S, S plus one square root. And so that would tell you uh, what the, the Zeeman effect associated with the spin would be. And one of the things that happens when you apply a spin to a case B molecule is you very quickly fully decouple the spin from the body frame. It's just waiting to be pulled away from the body frame. Uh, and so you get a, a Zeeman effect which changes from uh, a, a, a weak coupling of the spin to the body axis to something that uh, uh, is completely decoupled. And this is extremely important in understanding magnetic rotation spectra. Because in magnetic rotation spectra, uh, uh, the, the splitting of the states of different M sub J is very important. And uh, it's too much for me to try to explain. OK, so the message is you write one matrix you make the various coupling terms large or small compared to the differences in uh, diagonal elements, use perturbation theory, and you can generate these simple patterns. But you also can draw these pictures of vectors precessing, and you can get a sense for how much of some external interaction would it take to make one of these vectors stop precessing about this. You know that l lambda marks the internuclear axis and gives the spin something to feel. And, but it, uh, if lambda is zero, you still have the, the body axis, but there's nothing for S to feel. And so sigma states are always in case B or D. And uh, so that's all I have to say today. Next time, I will talk about perturbations, where you have states of different a lambda S character crossing each other instead of being systematically near each other. And so you get uh, level shifts and extra lines in the spectrum. And then after that, I'll talk about the Van Vleck transformation that enables you to correct uh, a, an isolated state for the effects of many remote states. And that's pretty much all I'm going to do on diatomic molecules, and then we'll start on polyatomics. <laughs>